I will take advantage that you are traveling to, to, to the seats uh, to introduce uh, Pierre Olivier Gurichas. Pierre Olivier is economic counselor and director of the research department at the International Monetary Fund and currently on leave uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, Giancarlo, hmm? take a seat, please. Is Pierre Werner Chair at the Robert Schumann Center and Professor of Economics at the European University Institute. And, uh, you know, today uh, is going to be, you know, this session is going to be dedicated to uh, the interconnection between fiscal and monetary. So, Pierre Olivier, you have the floor for the presentation of your, of your paper. And please uh, adjust to the time that uh, we have allocated, 25 minutes. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to present here. It's really a great pleasure. This is uh, work that is co-authored with Mai Dao, Alan Bizioli, Chris Jackson, and Daniel Lee. Daniel is in the room somewhere over there. Um, now, the usual disclaimer applies. Um, these are not necessarily the views of the IMF Management Executive Board or IMF policy. Now, the first paper in this session was talking about unconventional monetary policy and asset purchases. Now, this paper will ask about another set of unconventional policies that have emerged since the energy crisis in uh, 2022. And these are unconventional fiscal policies, and we are going to define them as the set of policies that are implemented or have been implemented by a number of countries to protect households and businesses from the energy crisis, but with a secondary objective of reducing headline and possibly core inflation along the way. And what our paper is going to attempt to do is assess the impact of these policies on inflation in the euro area. Now the starting point of our analysis is a surge in worldwide inflation. I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Everyone in this room knows what I'm talking about. What I'm showing you here is the decomposition of headline inflation, which is the black line on this figure, into core inflation. And here this is defined as the weighted median inflation. This is a measure of core that strips out the effects of unusually large changes in a number of prices. And the, this is in blue. And the remainder, shown in red, represents headline inflation shocks and reflects the importance of sharp shocks to a small number of prices, in particular energy. Now what you can see on the left is that headline inflation shocks represent a significantly larger share of inflation in the euro area, especially in 2022, compared to the US on the right, where in the US since basically December of last year, headline accounts for more, is accounted for by, by core for more than, uh, than its value. Now as also everyone knows here, this inflation surge has been followed by one of the most aggressive and synchronized tightening of monetary policy on record, and that's something you can see on the figure here. Um, even though inflation has remained somewhat persistent, something that has been emphasized by Gita Gopinath in her speech two days ago or by President Lagarde in her opening remarks yesterday. Now, so it's a very natural question in an environment like this to ask, is there a role for fiscal policy in helping to reduce inflation? And the textbook answer here is an unambiguous yes. Fiscal policy helps compress aggregate demand, and it also helps maintain the credibility of the overall anti-inflationary stance. In other words, it helps people thinking that there is no uh, there is no gap between what fiscal and monetary policy are trying to achieve. But in fact, a number of European economies have chosen a different path. They've aimed to directly contain the surge in energy prices on households and firms' budget, but also in doing so to reduce headline and possibly core inflation. This was articulated recently in a Vox EU piece by Francesco Gevazzi, until recently economic advisor to Mario Draghi. Now, these measures, what we call unconventional fiscal policy measures, were economically significant. What you see on the left is a, is a set of estimates that have been compiled by our colleagues in the Fiscal Affairs Department at the Fund of the size of these measures, broken down by different categories, whether they're targeted or untargeted, whether they're price suppressing or non-price suppressing across your area countries. And on average, they represent about 3.3% of GDP in 2022 and 2023, 1.3% in 2022, and an estimated 2% in 2023, most of the measures, about 2.7% of GDP, were going uh, to protect households and, and small and medium enterprise. What you see on the right is that these measures were also larger 
in countries with more initial exposure to the energy price shock, which is perhaps not uh, too surprising. Okay, so I'm going to present, now there are a number of reasons why we should be a little bit skeptical about uh, these uh, 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 unconventional fiscal policies. And actually the views were quite skeptical in the academic and economic community. There was a survey done in June of last year by the Booth School of Business that expressed that sentiment. Although there were a few dissenters, for instance, Olivier Blanchard, and I put the quote at the bottom, said, well, this is maybe one of those cases where a larger fiscal deficit can make the job of monetary policy easier. Now, let me list a few of the, a few of the uh, 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 criticism that had been voiced at the time. First, of course, energy support measures that would, in principle, increase energy demand and it would drive up the price of wholesale energy in a context where we have an energy crisis, energy is limited in supply, that could exacerbate the energy crisis and makes things worse, both on the energy side but also possibly on the inflation side. The second main concern was that fiscal measures were poorly targeted and they were costly. I just gave you some estimates of their budgetary cost. And so that would delay much needed fiscal consolidation in the wake of all the measures that were implemented during the COVID-19 crisis and in the context in which debt to GDP levels in many countries were already quite elevated. A third concern was that if the energy shock turned out to be persistent, then the measures would quickly become unsustainable from a budgetary standpoint. They would have to be removed and at that point, the increase in price would happen no matter what so that it would only delay the inevitable. And if the shock was transitory, it would perhaps smooth inflation, have a little bit less today, a little bit more tomorrow, but maybe not change accumulated uh, in a uh, change in price levels, so you wouldn't achieve any significant gains. And finally, there was a concern that the uh, stimulus, the positive uh, stimulus component of these measures would fuel aggregate demand and through the usual channels would in fact increase inflation and make the job of central banks even more complicated. So here, um, our focus in this paper is going to be narrowly on point three and four. We're not going to address directly the point about the impact on energy price. We have some in, in our model simulation, I'll show you that we have, we take that into account to some extent, but on, we're not going to dwell too much into this and we're not going to look directly at issues of uh, uh, fiscal uh, sustainability that could be raised by, by these measures. But we are going to be looking at the impact of these measures in terms of the inflation uh, shock and we're going to be looking at the persistence of the energy shock here. Now I want, to be very I want to be crystal clear that the first two concerns are very valid in our view. So we're not exploring them because we don't have really a framework that can address them. Doesn't mean that they are not relevant from a policy perspective. And I also want to state at the outset, just to be clear, that we agree that it's the primary task of monetary policy here, in particular the ECB, to be addressing uh, uh, price pressures and, and, and inflation instability. And so we are asking ourselves, well, in addition to what central banks are doing, what the ECB is doing, is there an effect of these type of measures on inflation dynamics? Okay. So let me illustrate with uh, a, a simple conceptual framework here um, that I think will be useful for thinking through uh, the kind of results we're going to be obtaining. So I want to focus on a situation where we have here a Phillips curve. That's what I'm representing on this graph. You have the output gap on the horizontal axis and you have the inflation rate on the vertical axis. So it's a very standard Phillips curve. If output is increasing, that there's going to be more price pressure and we have that uh, in, in many of our uh, monetary policy frameworks. Okay. Now this Phillips curve has three ingredients, the output gap, which you see here on the axis. It's going to have also supply shocks or what we call the headline inflation shocks related really to energy. I'm going to show them to you in a minute. And there is in the background also something that is related to inflation expectation. I'm not going to talk about this now, but it's going to be part of our framework as well. Now there's a growing body of uh, uh, empirical and some theoretical evidence that emphasizes the importance of non-linearities in Phillips curve. In other words, when the economy is running hot, the relationship between output gap and price is different than when the economy is, uh, is, is not as hot or is, is cool. Now this is illustrated on the figure that you have here by the slope of this relationship between the output gap and inflation. So we have a blue part of the curve to the left and the bottom at a point like point A where the economy is not running hot and where there is a relatively modest relationship between output gap and inflation. Okay. And then there is a steeper part of the curve that's in red where you have a point like point B where the economy might be running hot and where you have a sharper connection between price changes and economic activity. 
And that steep part of the curve is also where uh, stabilization policies, whether monetary or fiscal, are going to be most effective in sort of cooling off the economy. On the blue part of the curve, it's going to have less of an impact on, on inflation dynamics. Now, let me bring in our, uh, um, our unconventional fiscal policy and our headline inflation shocks in that picture. So the way you can think about headline inflation shocks here, it's like a supply shock. It's pushing up this curve. For any level of the output gap, you have a higher level of inflation. You have an energy crisis. It's increasing inflation across the board. And it means like a point like point A will now become the point like point C, which is vertically above it. And a point like point B will become a point like point D, which is also vertically above it, where you have more inflation uh, for the same level of uh, the output gap. Okay? Now, here in this context, what would unconventional fiscal policy do? Well, one way to think about it is that by neutralizing the increase in the energy prices, it's in fact going to bring down this higher Phillips curve, bring it down closer to the lower one that we had initially before the shock. In fact, if it absorbs in, in, entirely the increase in energy prices, let's say, we would be back to uh, the lower uh, Phillips curve in this diagram. But we would not end up back at point A or at point B because, in fact, what would happen in that case is that there is also a stimulative component of these unconventional fiscal measures. They are adding to aggregate demand. So we would move also move on the, along the curve to the right. So we would end up for instance, to the red, to the black dot that is to the right of point A, or we would end up to the black dot that is to the right of point B. Now, notice the difference between these two scenarios. In the first one, where the economy is sort of cool to start with, when these unconventional fiscal policy measures are implemented, they reduce inflation. There is a little bit of a stimulative effect, but we're on the flat part of the Phillips curve, and so we end up with some increase in output, but most importantly, with a reduction in inflation. By contrast, if the economy is running hot, you're starting from point D and you're implementing uh, these fiscal policy measures, you're going to bring down the economy back to the lower curve, but you're going to move to the right by the same stimulative uh, uh, policy. You're going to end up with a point that is up and to the right of point D. In other words, the stimulative effect will have overwhelmed your inflation-reducing effect, and you'll end up with more inflation. So what our paper is really doing is asking empirically which of these two scenarios is the most relevant one, given what uh, European economies have been implementing in, uh, the past, in the past year. Now, let me spend a minute giving you a summary of the main findings, and then I'll get into them. The so first result is that inflation in the euro area has been mostly driven by headline inflation shocks and not by overheating of the economy, unlike the United States. And I'm going to show you some decomposition here that make this point very sharply. The second result is that the unconventional fiscal policy measures help reduce inflation in the euro area by between 1 and 2 percentage point in 2022. They kept inflation closer to target both in 22-23 and also in, in 2024. There was a little bit less inflation in these first two years, and under our projections, there will be a little bit more inflation in 2024, but overall keeping inflation closer to target. About a third of the reduction is coming from a direct effect. You're reducing the headline inflation, the size of the shock. But two-thirds of the effect come from the pass-through of these headline inflation shocks into core inflation that is also muted once you reduce headline inflation shocks. And we find relatively limited effects from the stimulating uh, uh, part of the fiscal policy on aggregate demand. And instead, we find that there is some moderate stabilization of inflation expectations that comes from bringing down core and headline inflation. Now, when the nonlinearities in the Phillips curve, which are really important in the diagram I just showed you, are taken into account, the average inflation in the euro area between 2021 and 2024 is lower by about uh, 0.5 percentage point. So there is a net reduction in inflation as well. Now, we should not just stop there and think that somehow this is a miracle instrument and we should all just do this. In fact, we point out that there are a number of fortunate circumstances that help make this work in the European context. The first one is that the energy shock was very temporary and proved more temporary, in fact, than it was expected to be maybe a year ago. So energy prices came down, whether we were looking at gas or electricity or oil, they came down quite substantially over the last uh, six months or so. The second one, and that goes back to point number one, is that there was very little overheating in the euro area uh, 
to start with. And so we were sort of on the lower part of this Phillips curves where it was helpful to have these measures to bring down inflation. But by the same argument, if the economy is overheated, then uh, the set of results would be, would be very, very different. And I'll show you some uh, counterfactual simulations where we apply similar policies to an overheated economy, namely the US, and we, we find very, very different uh, results. Now, other factors are not explored here, as I've already mentioned. We're not looking at spillovers of these policies from one country to another. We're not looking too much at the impact on overall energy markets. We're not looking at fiscal sustainability. All of these things are important, but they are not the focus of what we do today. And so the conclusion is going to be that this is not a blanket endorsement. It's just the nature of the shock, the state of the economy, and the design of these fiscal instruments. Does do, all these things do matter in the end. All right, so let me now dig in into the, the, the way we establish these results. We're going to use both model-based simulations and empirical estimates in a complementary way. So first, we'll use our own IMF flexible system of global models, which is a, a semi-structural uh, um, model that we have to evaluate the impact of these unconventional fiscal policy measures as they were implemented in the euro area. So this is a semi-structural model with a lot of very interesting features. It has commodity production, there's consumption, trade, it's intertemporal. It has both liquidity constraint, Ricardian households, it has all kinds of bells and whistles. We use it all the time, we love it. Um, this is, uh, 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 within that model, we can impl implement and calibrate a number of very finely detailed fiscal policy tools to capture the effect of the fiscal measures that were implemented in the euro area. One drawback of that model approach is that it does not have the kind of nonlinear Phillips curve I argued is actually quite important. So you can think of this as showing you what would happen in a more complex model, but that does have a linear, a linear Phillips curve in the, in the background. So we're going to supplement this with an empirical framework that builds directly on estimating uh, a Phillips curve environment for the euro area and for the US that will allow for these nonlinearities. We'll find that they are important. They're important when we think about the uh, impact of slack on inflation, and also important when we think about the pass-through from headline inflation shocks to actual inflation. So there are two dimensions of nonlinearities here, and both of them are important in practice. We'll also allow in that framework for endogenous impact of inflation experience on inflation expectations. So if you have periods of inflation above target for a long time, that's going to feed into uh, inflation expectations, leading to some, uh, some amount of de-anchoring. And we're going to obtain some insights into the differences in inflation drivers for the U.S. and Euro area by doing that. So let me start with the model results. So I have one slide on the model results. You have three different panels on, on this figure here. The first one is showing you in a blue the path of inflation in 2022-2024 for the Euro area. We have separate results for France, Germany, and Italy in the paper in the absence of these fiscal measures. And everything is relative to a baseline where you have no energy, energy shock in the first place. And so you have more inflation in 2023, but then as the energy supply shock goes away, you would get in 2024 less inflation compared to a, a scenario without the energy supply shock in the first place. In red, we show you what happens when we feed into the model the energy uh, 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 the unconventional fiscal policy measures. What do we get? We get a little bit less inflation in 2023, and of course, as these measures are unwound, we get more inflation in 2024. This is what you see in the middle graph. Where the bars reflect the difference between the blue and the red lines for inflation on the left and for output on the right. We get a little bit less inflation in 2022, 0.9%, a little bit less inflation in 2023, 0.5%, and a little bit more inflation in 2024, 1.5%. The cumulative is slightly positive, but it's relatively small. So really what the measures are doing is they're reallocating inflation over time. They're smoothing the inflation path, keeping it closer to uh, inflation targets. Now, what I'm showing you on the right, remember these measures are um, uh, uh, expansionary. Here in the model, we're assuming that they're financed by uh, their deficit finance. We're asking, well, what if we close the deficit by cutting government uh, consumption by the same amount, about 3.3% of GDP in the euro area, what would be the impact on output and the impact on inflation? And that's what you have on the third panel. So you can think of this as the impact through the model of fiscal consolidation, okay, which is additive to uh, the other results. 
And what you see there is that there would be some impact on output growth. There would be lower output growth, both in 22 and 2023, of around 0.9% uh, uh, of GDP. But there would be also a little bit of moderation in inflation, but it's very, very modest, about 0.1% uh, uh, in 2022, 0.3% in 2023. Overall, the fiscal consolidation, so if you want to think about conventional fiscal policy, has some effect that goes in the right direction, but the effects are quite modest. Now, this is not a feature of our uh, paper. This is something that you have in most of the models that look at fiscal consolidation, and when you're on this somewhat uh, not very steep part of the Phillips curve, you get some impact in terms of output, but you don't get that much of an impact on inflation. Okay, so now let me turn to the role of nonlinearities and how our results might change. So we're gonna estimate a Phillips curve for the Euro area and for the US. So we're gonna have the three usual drivers of inflation, core inflation here, measures of labor market tightness. For the Euro area, we're gonna be using the unemployment gap. For the US, we're using the ratio of vacancies to unemployment. The reason we're using a different measure here of uh, labor market tightness is there is very strong evidence of a shift in the beverage curve in the US. There is no corresponding shift in the Euro area and the vacancy to unemployment rate allows us to capture that. So we have a slightly better fit for the US uh, with that. We have a second driver, which is the pass through of this headline inflation shocks to uh, core inflation. And so we're going to, there are a number of channels we can think about for this, uh, this pass through. It can come from labor markets and wage uh, uh, negotiations. So it can come from uh, price to price increases from energy and other high input costs to uh, uh, other parts of, uh, of, the, of the CPI. And then finally, we have inflation expectations where we're going to be using longer term expectations of inflation for the US, the survey of professional forecasters, 10 year forecast, and for the euro area, the ECB's uh, um, forecast for the five years ahead inflation. Okay, so here, what I'm showing you is our estimated Phillips curve, if you want, looking at two of the, the, the two drivers that are important here, the unemployment rate on the left hand side, and uh, the headline infl uh, inflation shocks, you can think of this as the pass through from headline inflation to core inflation on, on the right. In blue is the euro area, in red is the US. And this is a way to illustrate the extent to which we do find nonlinearities in the estimated relation between these two drivers and actual inflation. And if you look on the left at inflation gap versus unemployment, the thing that jumps at you is that for the euro area as a whole, there isn't much evidence of nonlinearities here. Maybe in part because the uh, Euro uh, your, your area has not been very overheated, so we've not been to the extreme left part of the, of the curve, unlike the US where you see this very sharp increase in the relationship as unemployment rates fall below, say, 4.5%. By contrast, when you look on the right, there is evidence of nonlinearities in the pass-through of headline inflation shock to core inflation, both for the US and for the Euro area, if anything, maybe even more for the Euro area, as you can see from the, uh, the, 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 the strength of the blue, uh, the blue curve here. So when we put all of these things together, we're allowed to decompose the actual uh, inflation experience between 2020 and 2023 through the drivers that we have in the Phillips curve. And this is uh, what you have both on the left for the Euro area and the US here. Um, the, the solid line is actual inflation, core inflation. Uh, the dash line is our fitted inflation uh, through the same period. And the red line is what happens if uh, we uh, basically only assume that there, are, there is the uh, output gap component. So we remove the headline inflation shocks from the estimation. So the red line is showing you what is the component that is coming from the economy's overheating. And the gap between the red and the blue is what's coming from headline inflation shocks. So this figure is quite striking in our view because you have almost mirror images between the US and the Euro area. In the Euro area, most of the increase in inflation is coming from headline inflation shocks. There is almost no contribution from overheating. In the US, by contrast, most of the increase in inflation is coming from overheating of the economy. Almost none of the increase in inflation is coming from the headline inflation shock. In cumulation, there was some component in the middle, but by 2023, it's mostly gone. Now, if we look ahead, and, and now start, I'm going to show you three uh, counterfactuals. I'm going to first say, okay, well, what would have happened now that we have this framework if we remove the unconventional fiscal policy 
And then I'm going to ask, you know, what would have happened if the shocks had been different or if we had been in a different environment? Now, in order to do this counterfactual, we need to feed in a different value for the price of energy uh, that would have happened if these measures had not been put in place. So we construct these counterfactuals using some uh, national statistical data from France, and we have some data from Spain for both gas and for uh, electricity. And so we have on the, on the right here, you have the counterfactual path for energy price relative to uh, uh, 2020 in the absence of the fiscal policy measures at the euro area level. Then we can take that and we can feed that sequence of headline inflation shocks into our Phillips curve. And that's going to tell us what will happen to headline uh, uh, to the uh, what we call the inflation gap, which is the gap between core inflation and expected inflation. And then the final step is to figure out what would be the impact on expected inflation itself, which is also a contribution to uh, the actual inflation experience. So we do this, this thing in, in three steps. Now, that middle step, when we feed in the counterfactual uh, path for uh, the headline inflation shock, removing the fiscal policy measures, we do this also taking into account the impact this will have on aggregate demand and through aggregate demand on the output gap and through that component of uh, the Phillips curve. Now, what do we find? So this is our first decomposition here. If I look at uh, the actual inflation experience between 2020 and 2023, this is the blue line. Then I remove the uh, fiscal policy measures, and so I get a, di a higher direct headline inflation shock. That's the light blue line. And then I get the pass through to core inflation that brings us to the orange and red lines. And then there is the aggregate demand component and the expectation, expectation drift, but these are relatively small. So what you see is that the inflation overall would have been 2.2 percentage point higher in 2022 on average. About one third of this would be the direct effect. Two thirds of this would be the pass through from headline inflation to core. Now I'm, I'm running a little bit low on time, so I'm gonna take a minute to, uh, to wrap up and, and present the two, uh, 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 three more slides, um, 20 seconds each. Um, so then we ask, what happens if we look beyond 2023? What happens if we say the headline inflation shocks, that there won't be any more inf headline inflation shocks going ahead, and we're gonna let the system sort of run, and what would happen to inflation, both with the measures and without the measures? So the blue line shows you what our estimation predicts for inflation in the euro area from 20, 2023 onward. And what you see is that inflation would be coming down and would land close to inflation target by 2024. Okay? In red, we show you what would have happened if none of the measures had been implemented. And that means higher inflation 2022, 2023, but an undershoot in 2024 where inflation would have fallen below uh, target at about 1.6 percent. The right hand side shows you the difference between the two curves. On average, the red line says there would have been inflation would have been lower throughout the period thanks to these measures by about 0 0.5 percentage point. As I said, there was a set of fortunate circumstances. Two, sets of, two reasons why these fortunate circumstances are there. One is the energy shock was very temporary. So what would have happened if the energy shock was instead much more persistent if it was permanent. So let's assume that energy prices would have remained at their October 2022 peak, and gradually the fiscal measures would have to be unwound throughout 2023 because they would become unsustainable. What would have happened to inflation? Well, you can see on uh, this figure that it would have been more inflation, both of course with and without the measures, that's a given, but mostly the measures would have led to a much more persistent inflation. Inflation would have remained higher for much, much longer. And in fact, in this simulation, inflation expectations would start drifting upwards more significantly. And so inflation would remain higher for a much, much longer time. So the transitoriness of the energy supply shock was a really important factor in helping why, understand why these measures may have been uh, quite effective. Final slide I want to show you, what would happen if the economy is hot to start with? Well, in that case, we're kind of in point B point D part of the Phillips curve here, I'm doing the uh, counterfactual on the US. So I'm starting from the US, I'm feeding in measures that are comparable to what happened in the Euro area in terms of the fiscal impulse and in terms of the uh, reduction of energy prices. And what you see, starting from the blue line, is that it would bring down inflation due to the direct effect, 
but pretty quickly by 2023, inflation starts drifting up again. In fact, the gap by uh, April 2023 is about 1.6 percentage point. In other words, the aggregate demand effect overwhelms the direct reduction of inflation. Okay? So conclusion, in the euro area, this helped reduce inflation by about one, two percentage point in 2022. The channels are direct <clears throat> and the path through from headline to core inflation. We have, uh, we would have had needed a much larger conventional fiscal tightening to, obs to obtain similar measures. So here these measures were in a sense much more effective. And um, finally, there was quite a, there was a bit of luck involved. The economy was not overheating and most importantly, the energy price shock was uh, very uh, temporary, as it turns out to be. Of course, a lot of research is still needed on these questions. Thank you. So now, Giancarlo, it's your turn. Here, Olivia, you have only exceeded four minutes. Well, that's the norm of the, this morning. Okay, Giancarlo, I am sure that you will stick to the time. It's much shorter. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the ECB, President Lagarde. And it's a pleasure and a challenge to be here. I start saying that uh, the view expressed in each slides do not necessarily uh, reflect the view expressed in the previous slides, because I will have a little bit of a complex discussion to present to you. So uh, this is, uh, I'm going to do three things. A, a small discussion of the working of the conventional fiscal policy uh, on the paper results and key policy implications, and then a context for the exercise. So um, unconventional fiscal policies are very conventional for a political point of view. So you know, like parties or governments may be worried about distribution, may be worried about firms, may be worried about demand, and these kind of measures help also firms, right, in the sense that, for example, reduce the pressure for higher uh, wages and remuneration by keeping the impact of CPI inflation or large shock low. And uh, it is good policy, it's smoothing potentially destabilizing shocks and when the shock is large, you know, people may be creative on instruments. And I think it also, they also fit what we did in the last 10 years, which is we sort of gamble on future recovery, gamble on better times. For many, we have very large shocks and every time we consider value at risk in our policies, you know, price stability today, um, uh, basically always assessing adjustment now versus larger adjustment tomorrow, larger cost adjustment tomorrow with some probability. So it is rational to absorb shocks in this kind of value at risk attitude. Uh, we wrote a paper for the IMF with somebody at the, with Bartos at the uh, ECB. So I wanted to start with a quick example of uh, unconventional fiscal policy in action taken from the Italian Fiscal Council, which is a very serious and well-structured institution. And here we show a calculation with a micro simulation model, like very rich in data. Uh, uh, basically the impact on nominal spending on consumption of uh, a number of uh, unconventional fiscal policy. So you see uh, to the to the left is 2022. Without uh, these policies, inflation would have been 9.6, with this po of which seven energy. With this policy, it went down to five. Now, in uh, 2023, with the uh, fall in energy price and the uh, withdrawal of uh, uh, the uh, measures, stay basically at five, which is a little bit what is an example of what uh, Pierre Olivier was showing, and. Uh, also, if we do by the size of income, you see that this is a way also to, to address the nasty regressive tax effect of, of, of uh, taxation. In the sense, by the size of, the, the, the of income, you see that the inflation would hit lower, uh, lower income households much, much more. There's a beautiful paper by Lucas Nord on this. This is done without the substitution or goods that comes with that inflation. But remember, poor households have much less to substitute from. So the, the, it, it would be not, not far. What we see in this graph is not far from reality. And you see that inflation stay much lower with this uh, measure in 2022. And it's a little bit higher in 2023, also because the, the shock propagates. So it goes into goods and services. So this is basically you know, a, a one example of what uh, Pierre Olivier was showing us 
uh, very clearly. And it's nice, an example nice because it's, it's micro, micro base, so like it's, it's one of a large data set. So the, the paper by, uh, uh, presented today by the authors is at the same time very ambitious and very humble in the sense that humble is, is not a grand jury out of whether this could have been done better, like, you know, cost, risk, debt to GDP ratio, incentive, efficiency. It's more about, uh, given what was done, what is, the, what is the effect on output and inflation? And the verdict is that, uh, with, with some caveat, successful is moving inflation shocks in 2020 to 2023, which I think is a, is a very fair assessment. Now, the results at the glance repeats what I showed you before. So there is a, a substantial smoothing impact in 2022 that uh, was basically paid, quote unquote, with a little bit of more inflation in the future. And the simulation is actually good because it avoided the uh, undershooting of, uh, of uh, inflation. So this is the, the picture that Piero Rivier showed a few minutes ago. Uh, one thing I should, should say, suppose we are worried about debt to GDP ratio. This is a quick and dirty uh, estimate that I did with an Excel file on the contribution of the C G GDP deflator inflation to, to the ratio in Europe uh, in the data. Uh, from the result of Pierre Olivier, this measure would not have changed from the denominator much. I mean, the, the inflation rate would have been a, a little bit affected, but not much. More on the nu numerator, like the, because it's deficit. No? The, 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 the dynamic would have been affected by the deficit. Now, let's come to the model. The model, basically, it's a, a Phillips curve model where core inflation, net of inflation expectation, a regress on unemployment gap for the EA, and headline inflation shocks which is basically the memory of changes in the relative price out of the medium in the past. So, and what is interesting is that if you compare the example before COVID and after COVID, the unemployment gap becomes a little bit steeper, negative, but remain linear. It was actually not linear before, but with the wrong sign. No? It has this kind of strange positive nonlinearity. It's linear. While the memory of the inflation, the propagation of inflation shock, becomes nonlinear. So there is this tension between the slope of the Phillips curve that is linear and the memory, <laughs> the propagation which is nonlinear, which is then become dominant in all exercises. I do a, a, um, they do a cubic model for the US where they change the unemployment gap with the vacancy uh, uh, ratio. Uh, I, 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 I do the, the quadratic instead of the cubic they do, and the results is actually that both are nonlinear. It's a little different from what they show because with the cubic there is more, more significance there, but is, if you look at the, at, the, at the graph on the relevant support, it's basically uh, almost the same uh, prediction from a quadratic instead of a cubic uh, regression. Okay, so uh, what are the implications? You already show you that the, the composition of the euro area versus the United States tell a very different story. Mostly overheating in the United States, mostly propagation of shock in the euro area. Uh, what can we say here? Basically, you know, propagation of headline inflation shocks take time. And uh, it's a tight spot for policy because leaning against the memory of the shock the sacrifice ratio is high because you, you fight with a linear weapon and non-linear wave from the past. So I needed to think better about this, this thing because you know, the, the message is uncomfortable, both for fiscal and monetary policy. I mean, you can lean against the past, the propagation, but it's going to be costly. So let me go back to the Barcelona report, which is in the hall, if you want to have it. Xavier uh, Wilson is right, ready to autograph his Autograph it for you. <laughs> the, uh, we start with the narrative of the crisis using this graph, United States Euro area, where output is plot against core, core inflation. So core inflation against output, right? Cecilia uh, Pine Phillips curve. The, no, it's not a Phillips curve, it's just a, a, a description, right? But it's a useful description because it, it gives you three phases. The, bl the black or the, the is basically the COVID, the reopening, and the inflation crisis. 
okay, in, in the two, in the two uh, countries. And it's a beautiful way to organize your thinking because there is a lot of uh, time line here, right? So we have the boom in good prices. The good prices are tradable. So there is a global component of inflation. The good prices are intensive in energy and commodities. So there's a global component of inflation that propagates around the world. And then there is the catch up of, of services that you see here, right? Now, it is not a Phillips curve. It is not a Phillips curve because to, to be a Phillips curve, you need to take a, stack, a stand on the slack. So where is potential output on the x-axis? Right? And unfortunately, all the indicators of slack started to move differently. They were very well behaved before COVID. After COVID, they just moved differently. And if you look into the slack, granularly is a mess because there is sectoral differences, granular misalignment, both in, in price dynamics and conditions in each market. Then you have the issue of expectations, and then you, ha you have the issue of energy shocks and other shifter. So to bring this picture into Phillips curve is a you know, job for professionals. You. So, so let me, so this is amazing. I actually, it's not very often that we have such a big misalignment in prices, right? In the report, you have the picture going back, back, back. Sometimes it last one quarter, but like this, we haven't seen it, right? So I think it's important to start with this narrative because the energy shock does not fall into a linear steady state. It falls into this situation. Actually, the energy shock is in part also fed by this situation. So how do we bring, it, how do we bring, how do we think about our economies, no? So uh, let me go to the other report, not the Barcelona, but the Geneva report by Veronica. <laughs> Uh, uh, the the, the for, for women report, actually, as, as they say. So, so let's think of the economy as a, a simple structure where you have manufacturing, services, and wages. You can do it in a network, so also with up, uh, upstream and downstream. Nominal rigidity, we think it's, it's increasing when you go down, right? So the, the shock was, at the beginning, a big change in the markups in opposite directions. Right? Markups go up for goods, down for, and, and it starts percolating, propagating in the economy. Then the shock goes into that big mass of propagation. And, you know, uh, you can choose in principle any average inflation there, right? But with different nominal rigidities and the situation of the COVID, a zero inflation would be a disaster for the economy. You want to accommodate, right? It's reasonable, it's rational. There's nothing to be, uh, to be ashamed of. of uh, applying good principles from you know, uh, economics to, to go for, to minimize the efficiency cost of, of uh, price deviations when there are different degrees of rigidities in nominal. So the, the question that we are now, so actually you can complicate the model because with energy, clearly the energy has a strong impact upstream on the manufacturing, a little bit less on the services, but then it goes with the intermediate, immediate. there is also this intermediate good transmission. And then there is the feedback effect on wages, which is sometimes delayed. And I think this is one of the big issues now. Now, what, what is the, how, to, how you set inflation to govern the feedback effect of wages that are at the same time, you know, fair for workers? We can, you know, we cannot expect workers to accept a, a, an enormous fall in, in, in a real, real wages, fair for workers and good for the economy as a whole. You can complicate Le uh, Elisa Rubo as uh, a Phillips score with all the input output, uh, Lorenzo Niverni, Benigno Eggerson add the complication to this. And, and uh, our report is not technical, but it's a narrative. But we all like saying, we are singing more or less the same song here. And, and this is exactly what, what uh, Pierre Olivier has in the, uh, and company uh, have in the, in the model. Because remember, their inflation, the shock, infl infl inflation shock is the change from the medium in each industry or in some industries, which means a situation like COVID in which, you know, 50% of the firm may not immediately change prices. The other one raise prices. What equals inflation shocks record the, the adjustment of the price of goods at the beginning, and then the coming up from the back of the price of, price of services. So should I be critical of the, of, the, of the paper? Yes, a little bit. The discussant role is to be critical. Do I believe the UGAP? of the uh, IMF. It's a, you know, there are honorable people, so <laughs> I should believe them. But I have a problem because 
If I look at their measure of UGAP, relative to today, labor market was much tighter before the great financial crisis in the 90s. And we know that unemployment, so the game of choosing the R star, U star, E star <laughs> is, a, is a difficult game. So I went into try to, so I also look at, at the picture. So the, the regression as the black is before the COVID, red is after the COVID. Um, see, when you add the red, in principle, you go from a strange nonlinear to a linear. So the, 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 the regression will try to, to, to look at the, the linearity despite the shifter, no? because remember, they have the shifter for the past inflation. And what is also interesting is that today, in April 23, we actually, it's actually pretty good. The, the core inflation, <laughs> net of expectation, is one of the lowest. So the question is, where, where are we today? I uh, call Shorty. Uh, my former student, Riccardo Trezzi, underline inflation, I guess uh, President <laughs> Powell no, knows him from, from the past day in the Fed. And Riccardo and other people uh, express this opinion that the, uh, uh, actually, maybe there are other, other measures of tightness for, for Europe, and especially employment. Okay, so we have in many countries employment hours had is very, very high. And uh, so when I ran, I could not really get the nonlinearity, but I didn't have the time to actually look at it. So there is an issue of how tight the labor market is today. I think it's a very important question. And this is not in the gap, just the employment rate. Um, again, I, I, it could be high because of the shifter, or it could be high because of the, <laughs> of the employment tightness. Uh, the vacancy ratio, uh, I have this joke, vacancies everywhere except in the statistics in Europe, but it doesn't really matter because <laughs> in a way it depends on measurement, but also depends, so, suppose you have two countries, right? One, one has very quick feeling, the other one has not very quick feeling. The, the, tie, the vacancy may not, we, we could have a tight labor market independent of the shift of the beverage curve. So th there, is, there are issues that need to be, to be worked out uh, more uh, deeply. So um, uh, I, I run out of time. But let me, let me conclude with my, my, my view. Okay, we could be in a much tighter labor market, but remember the message of the paper is that non-linearity versus linear. Okay, if the memory is non-linear and, and your instrument is linear, there is an issue there. So even in a tight labor market, even a tight labor market, uh, you can have a sacrifice ratio that is worth considering with, with much uh, carefully. And uh, if I look into the black box of the A, uh, private consumption is still below trend, right? Where does the market tightness come from? It comes from government spending and maybe the export market, right? So will government spending be there? Uh, would a, or, or if you want, even if the, the sacrifice, if, if you are a little bit more nonlinear, wouldn't it be a better idea to get together monetary and fiscal policy to work against inflation in this situation. And, and, and then you have all other questions that we discussed, like ongoing effect of tightening, the effect on expectation and everything. But uh, this is, to me, is, is, is where the conundrum of the European policy making is, the fact that we also need to shift G to, to C. I, again, I don't know the export dynamics in the future. There, there are shadows there <laughs> that is not clear how much it is. But I want to conclude just to say that uh, despite this um, complication that I see in the paper, for the retrospective analysis, I think it's a very good paper. It, it really captures what, what, what happened. Of course, Pierre Olivier is always saying not to be repeated without adult supervision is not, <laughs> is not something that can, you can replicate in all circumstances. But, but it was actually n not as crazy as initial pessimistic view uh, were saying. Taking the analysis forward, I think, is a little bit more involved. Yeah, there, there is a lot of issues. And by the way, the, the, the policy mix, again, this is a, the, the, what we, we see in the Barcelona report, I think very soon we'll have a little bit of a changing game, going from this uh, cooling down and dealing with the inflation to reshaping the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy, in which there will be a larger role for fiscal policy to rebalance demand, there will be debt sustainability, which according to our calculation is possible, is a narrow path, but this narrow path can only be walked down 
with a sensible interaction of monetary and fiscal policy, whereas the guiding principle of monetary policy, the monetary policy is useless if it's not credible. So th this is a, a little bit the conundrum. No, you need to have interaction with monetary policy, but monetary policy cannot interact in a virtuous way if it's not credible. And for Europe, you know, the issue of monetary backstop and liquidity and the convenience seal that we discussed this morning, I think is gonna be central. Thank you, thank you very much. Before opening the floor, uh, Pierre Olivier, do you, do you want to react to the comments made by? Yeah, thank you. First, thank you, uh, Giancarlo. Giancarlo. Really uh, uh, very insightful. I, uh, just two things, I, I, two comments I, can, I, I want to offer. So first, I think it's important to separate COVID and the aftermath of COVID and uh, how this impacts inflation dynamics and the energy crisis of, of 2022. And I think we can, we can all agree that uh, a lot of the inflation experience that we've had uh, in, in one way or another is also related to the economy's reopening and, 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 and supply demand imbalances. Um, but we are looking more narrowly at what happens at the, uh, in the, uh, con as a consequence of the energy crisis. The, the second point I want to make is um, on the measures of the gap, because of course it's, it's, it's critical. And here I think you're, you're right, you, you can look at different indicators and, and they point in different directions. When we look at the euro area, if you look at unemployment, maybe it looks like it's not, uh, it's a little bit tight, but maybe not too much. If you look at output, it, it suggests that, you know, uh, 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 output in the euro area is not back to the pre-2019 trend, so there is, there is some gap there. If you, look at, uh, 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 if you look at employment, it looks high, but if you look at hours, it looks low. So I think, I think we're sort of within the range of, uh, within the range of estimates. I'd, I'm not feeling too bad about where we land on the, on the measure of, uh, of tightness for the euro area. Stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre Olivier, Eric, and uh, you have the floor. Mm. Uh, thanks very much, Eric Nielsen from Union Credit. Um, thanks very much for this IMF paper. Uh, really interesting, I thought very um, uh, persuasive. If you had done this paper, or I knew the result a year ago or thereabout, um, seeing the differences in shocks, differences in economic outcome, would you have recommended what has de facto been virtually identical monetary policies in the two areas. Yeah, so Harold Uli from the University of Chicago. This is a very thought-provoking paper. I'm still skeptical, but I was uh, mostly struck by the precision of the, you know, in awe, by the precision of the numbers uh, given out here. So the whole analysis rests on the Phillips curve, which has been a super frustrating tool for all of us. If you look at the Phillips curve, it's actually not a curve, it's a cloud, and then people try to do all kinds of tricks to you know, resurrect the curve from that. So here we have a nonlinear Phillips curve. I think there was a slide on there which was estimated with great precision, for example, for the EU, there was a 95% confidence band. I mean, it, so it was, uh, you know, I have to think about where that comes from, right? So if I think about what goes into the sausage, let's say, right? If I think about the shock decomposition that was done here, I could start from a simpler model, which is a linear VAR, if I, and then try to estimate, try to identify the shocks in the linear VAR and do decomposition based on that. In order to do that, I would have to estimate the VAR, and then I would have to have an identification schemes. And usually there's not that kind of precision that we have seen here. Now, if, I, if, I, if I'm absolutely confident, if I have strong priors about the VAR, co uh, VAR uh, coefficients and the identification scheme, you know, maybe I can get to precise results of that sort. But that raises a question whether what we are seeing here is a result of priors rather than data, and that gets me very nervous. Even if I take a theoretical model, let's take a DSG model, the smets wouders model, which is very popular, was developed at the European Central Bank, has been a core analytical tool at the European Central Bank for many years, I think, still is at this day. If you, if you take that model, right, the aggregate economy is driven by seven shocks. There is a Phillips curve trade-off built into the model, but if you look at the actual realization of the inflation unemployment trade-off, in order to replicate the Phillips cloud that we are seeing, you know, it's different shocks that come to play. In fact, the actual Phillips curve that we see in the data shows that inflation is driven by some set of shocks and unemployment is driven by another set of shocks and they are you know, unrelated, they are uncorrelated in fact. And, and the Phillips curve that we like to use as a theoretical menu, 
and have been using as a theoretical menu doesn't show up in that empirical trade-off. So I'm just, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, we all yearn for the precision of the numbers and it's, it's lovely to see, you know, point three happens if we turn off that fiscal policy and so forth, right? And I'm just, I'm just wondering whether you can illuminate how we can be certain that the numbers are as precise as you've shown them. Thank you very much. Uh, let's complete, uh, complete the first round of uh, questions with a third question. Thank you very much. I think this is a very nice paper to put some numbers on the impacts of unconventional fiscal policy and some of the trade-offs. But I had two comments or suggestions. Uh, first, I hope you will extend this paper to include the UK. Uh, the UK, I, whether it's for this, this, this conference or another uh, paper, but the UK would be a very useful example of a country that has the inflationary sh external inflationary shock with an unconventional energy response, as in the euro area, combined with a very tight labor market, as in the US. So it could be a very useful country to make the example that you rushed through at the end, but highlighted more in the paper, of how the trade-offs could be different with a very tight labor market. Um, and I think that could be particularly important for the debate in the UK, where the strong, unconventional fiscal response was in the context of a tight labor market, and there now has been a large inflation overshoot. And part of that could be because of the interaction of these policies with these nonlinearities you highlight, which was not in most of the inflation models. So to put a number on how much of the inflation overshoot this might explain, again, would be very helpful. Um, the second comment, more quickly, is at the start of your paper, you had a very nice graph where you showed that even countries that might have done a roughly similar magnitude of this unconventional fiscal policy did it in very different ways. For example, some were price suppressing, some were not price suppressing, some were targeted, some were not targeted. It looks like in your model you could differentiate the effects of these different types of policy on inflation and the growth trade-off. So I was wondering if you'd run any of these simulations where you could say that, say, the types of policy followed by France versus by Germany, which were very different, some were price suppressing, some not price suppressing, did some lead to a bigger shift down in the Phillips curve in terms of bringing inflation down with less impact on growth, so less concern if you have a tight labor market. So the, the trade-off could be quite different based on the type of policy. And I think your model could be very useful to understand that if we are in this scenario again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pierre Olivier, take Thank into consideration that we are entering into the, the yes, topic break I'll, time. I'll, I'll be brief. So first, uh, the first question on monetary policy, I, I, I would flip, a, flip it around. I mean, I would say, I mean, these measures have been implemented. If these measures had not been implemented, inflation would have been much higher. Monetary policy would have had to do even more, probably. So it's certainly not our view that uh, what has been implemented by the ECB, for instance, was, uh, was, was too much or, or is too much. Um, on Harold, on, on the precision, and, and uh, there are two parts to this. Uh, you, you, your point was about precision, which we can all agree that precision is, uh, you know, uh, we could put some standard uh, confidence bands on, on, on any of these things. I'm not going to vouch for the second decimal of some of the estimates, but I think that's true in general. There's a broader question of the Phillips curve and whether we, we think there is a Phillips curve. Now, on this, we may agree to disagree. I mean, I think there is, a, there is a lot of evidence that we do have a Phillips curve, that once we do the empirical work carefully, once we control for some of the confounders, it's there, it shows up in the data, it has the right slope, and that slope has changed. Uh, actually, there's a very nice paper out there that uh, uh, is, is documenting that also for, uh, for uh, the U.S. Uh, using using city level data, so I'm I'm, I'm pretty confident uh, on this. Now, Christine, the UK, um, we that was part of the original plan. We really wanted. We got close, but uh, not close enough that we felt confident uh, putting the results there. But for precisely the reason you mentioned, it would be great to have it. And on the on the granularity of the measures, um, we could do it in the model, not in the Phillips curve uh, estimation. But let me offer something. There is something that is tantalizing here, which is you'd like to find the kind of measures that would not be price distorting, uh, because you don't want to mess up with the energy market, and you know I left that out, but it's in the background. And at the same time, you'd like to have something that maybe helps on the inflation dynamics. And now it's an open question as to whether you know if you send households a check that says I cover X percent of last year's energy bill, uh, so you don't have as much of a you know cost of living crisis, but I'm not changing the marginal price you're facing if you buy an extra kilowatt, then whether that aff affects inflation dynamics, I suspect it might because it reduces the pressure to go, go to your boss and ask for an increase in wages, or you know, if you're a firm, pass it on the prices because you face a higher cost. So I think there's something to explore there about things that are not necessarily price depressing, but might still have an impact on, on inflation dynamics.
there, you know, I have, we have, I think that we have time for a couple of questions more. Oscar Orte, and uh, I see a lady. Let's diversify a little bit, you know, the questions, okay. taking into consideration the question. Thank you, Silvia Ardania from Barclays. Hi, thanks for this great paper. Uh, I, back to what you said on the intuition responding to Christine, I think it's very important to highlight the channel of this measure through wages and also on the more conventional policy. And here what I have in mind is what the German government, for example, did it. By providing tax incentives to one-off bonuses, de facto provided incentive not to uh, increase wages of the public employees or private employee by, the, you know, by a larger extent. And I think he can give you different results also on your persistence of inflation afterwards once you remove these measures because negotiated wages would have gone up by much more, which means that uh, you know, inflation would have been more persistent afterwards. It could be important for fiscal sustainability. After all, a one-off tax incentive is a temporary measure. If you increase the wage bill forever, it's permanent. And you can look back at the literature that Alberto Alessina has done with various co-authors or Gita on the fiscal devaluation. That would have important supply-side implications by yeah. shifting the supply side and so giving you less tightness, in a sense, from, uh, uh, from your results. Thanks. Thank you very much. And finally, Oscar Arte. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre Olivier. This is a very good contribution, especially for those of us in the business of uh, doing forecasting for the euro area. Um, I like very much the analysis, but it came to my mind, one, uh, to my attention, one, one important difference, uh, quantitative difference, which is in terms of the positive impact that the removal of the measures will uh, have on inflation in 24. If I remember well, your estimate is around uh, 1.5 extra percentage points in inflation in 24, following the removal of the of the measures. We have an alternative estimate in the in the euro system. I will not claim ours is better because this is a very tricky issue. It's very complex. Many uh, hundreds of measures in many different uh, jurisdictions. So there is a lot of uncertainty when estimating this thing. But uh, our estimate is roughly half of that. I mean, the, the positive impact uh, on inflation in 24 will be roughly half of this 1.5%. And I was trying to rationalize what is behind this difference. I have two potential explanations, and I would like to know your view on this, uh, Pierre Olivier. First, at the Euro system, we assume that uh, only 70% of those measures in place in 23 will be removed in 24, with the remaining 30% being removed later in 25. So this may explain part of this difference. And the other has to do with the way uh, the methodology to calculate this uh, marginal uh, impact. No? I mean, in our case, uh, we think that some of these measures, especially those implemented via uh, caps on prices, at the time of the removal, they will not be uh, binding, or they will be binding only to a very small extent. So the removal of these price caps will not push inflation up precisely because the level of the energy prices at that time will be lower than when these measures were implemented in, 23, in 22 and, and 23. So to some extent, this may explain this, this difference. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the end of 25, we get a negative impact on the price level, an accumulated uh, negative impact on the price level. Of course, when you take into account the demand channels, this uh, negative impact on the, on the price level gets somewhat reduced because of this demand channel. But my view on, this, on the demand channel is that this time, perhaps, it will not be very strong, precisely because the measures were not well targeted. They were all across the board, and they were too many people that really didn't need this money. No? So people with a very, very low marginal pro propensity to consume. So this leads me to think that perhaps this general equilibrium Keynesian demand channel this time will not be super powerful, but I would like to know your view on this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Oscar. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. So and afterwards, I will give the floor to Giancarlo. Uh, so first, Sylvia, I, yes, I, I, I agree that, um, again, uh, this is a call to explore, you know, how to design these kind of measures maybe in a, in a more efficient way. Uh, Oscar, we can, we can take that up bilaterally, but I think you, you hit the right thing, it, it, to be clear, when we talk about the 1.5 uh, percentage point, this is the extra inflation compared to a path where you didn't have the measures at all, while I think maybe some of your calculation is relative to where you were the previous year. So I think that, that is uh, maybe part of the difference. I'll stop here.
Ricardo, no. do you want to add anything? No, just very, bri very briefly, the paper is actually richer in many dimensions. We haven't discussed the, the expectation and everything. So it's uh, actually uh, one thing that perhaps th th what one could draw from this is the fact that maybe like models could be brought a little bit more complex on, on the propagation. So, so we, need, we need to uh, enrich models, maybe not, not going completely micro, but uh, the, the uh, different sectors, the way in which uh, they respond to large shocks is a little bit the, the, the game no, at this point, just to understand better what are the, you know, what are the trade-off and exactly the cost of, uh, of intervening, uh, you know, reflecting shocks that create a lot of disaggregation, a lot, a lot of the, uh, heterogeneity. So that's, the, I think, one of the big conclusions of the... Well, thank you very much to both of you. I am not going to be so pretentious as to try to summarize uh, and to sum up, uh, you know, perhaps only, you know, two comments. First, fiscal policy has a role to play. Monetary policy cannot be the only kid in town. And second, if it does not uh, have a positive impact on inflation, perhaps the fiscal policy should try to avoid uh, entering into conflict with monetary policy, because it would have you know, uh, consequences in terms of uh, reaction of the markets and financial stability considerations. And with that, Claire, 